Um, we're now going go to go to our round table event. Um, and the question that our panel are going to be discussing is, can digital pathology break down international borders? Now, our panel have been each given a question for them to think about, but, the, but we will throw those open to the other panel members around, uh, as well. So the panel round table will go on till uh, about 12.35, and then we'll have 15 minutes or so for, for questions, uh, uh, for the panel to answer questions that anyone puts in the Q&A box. So if you've got some questions for our panel, do please put them in the Q&A box. And at the end of the meeting, we will discuss that. Now, rather than me introduce everybody, I think it would be much better if we went around and people could introduce themselves and briefly say where they work and, and, and their area of, of interest. So uh, in no particular order, just from the way the list is, if we, uh, Bethany. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Brilliant to be here today. I'm Dr. Bethany Williams, and I am the lead for digital pathology training and education at the National Pathology Imaging Cooperative, which is based here in uh, Leeds in the United Kingdom. That's a big project. We're doing lots of things. We're putting scanners into hospitals. We're connecting hospitals together, uh, and we're also doing some work on, on AI. Uh, my background is in patient safety aspects of uh, digital pathology, and I'm also the clinical lead at that centre for patient and public involvement in digital pathology and pathology AI related projects. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Mooney. Uh, hi, um, I'm uh, uh, Samar Bet Mooney. I'm a consultant neuropathologist. I work um, in Sheffield which is in South Yorkshire in England um, as a consultant neuropathologist. I've been interested in digital pathology probably since about 2014-15 and my particular interest is how we um, establish approaches to roll out digital pathology in a sustainable connected way so that it serves all of our patients and it's been really interesting this morning getting um, the, the international flavour of how technology can help our patients around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Alajlan, if, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, I think you may be on mute. Uh, yeah, uh, my thank name. You. Thank you for inviting me. My name is uh, Abdulaziz Al Ajlan. I'm a chairman of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at, at King Abdulaziz Medical City, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm a, a consultant pathologist and a dermatopathologist. Uh, I have done my training in the UK, and uh, I got my fellowship from the UK and. Uh, also, I have done, you know, the training in uh, the US, and I did my dermatopathology. In addition, I have been in the digital pathology for more than 14 years, and I have some new innovations that you know, in digital pathology will be released soon. Thank you very much. Professor Nuresh. Morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to join all of you. Um, I'm currently uh, a pathologist at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in the United States and the section head of pathology here. But before coming here, I spent 17 years at the Imperial College and the Hammersmith Hospital. Uh, that was where my first introduction to digital pathology happened. Uh, and my initial introduction to this was on more on an educational basis of how to use digital pathology to teach um, residents and fellows. But as the days have passed on, I've been involved in digital pathology uh, on, the, on the research front. And currently, my involvement has been more in, in terms of multiplex immunohistochemistry, chemistry, automatic analysis of that, and also in a technology called Codex technology, which where you can use 40, anti, 40 to 50 antibodies on a single slide. Uh, so my interest has varied over a period of time, but I don't have any specific expertise in in artificial intelligence, but I'm more of a user. And so I bring a perspective of uh, my questions, my quest of how to understand this and the problem that I have faced. But I'm a simple pathologist. Thank you very much. And last, but by no means least, Dr. Carey. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Um, hello, I'm uh, welcome to everybody. Happy International Pathology Day. Um, I'm Peter Carey. I'm a haematologist at the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle upon Tyne, which is in the northeast of England. And I specialize now mainly in diagnostic hematopathology, but I've had clinical practice in pediatric hematology and, and hemoglobinopathy. Um, and I'm also involved in the um, uh, the National External Quality Assessment Schemes for Peripheral Blood and Marrow Morphology in the UK. Um, and together with um, paediatric oncology colleagues, um, we also uh, help to run a, a pathology service remotely for the Children's, uh, uh, children's Cancer Hospital in Blantyre in Malawi, which, 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 which I may touch on as part of the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so as our panel know, they've each been furnished with a question, but that question is not exclusively for them. What I intend to do is go through and ask each of them to talk about their question and then throw it open to input from the rest of the panel. So if we start off with, with uh, Bethany, um, what do we as a profession need to do to make sure we are really ready for pathology-based AI? Yeah, well, there's a few approaches to this question. I suppose the first thing that I would say is there's sort of two things that come very easily to us as pathologists. Very simple things we can all do is keep inquisitive and keep asking awkward questions. Um, that may come back to bite me later on in this session, but I, I would um, definitely recommend that um, you know everybody at some level try to get involved and try to get engaged. This is a really, really important time, you know, in the in the history of our profession, and you've got a really great opportunity to influence and to have your opinion heard. A lot of people, when they find out that I work in digital pathology and in AI will, AI will immediately say, oh, no, that's not for me. I'm not a technological person. I don't have an iPhone. No, you know, I'm going to sit back, sit in the back for this one. That's entirely the wrong attitude. We are all subject experts in pathology, in diagnostics, in making sure our patients get optimal diagnostics and optimal treatment. And our voice is extremely important um, in the development and the rollout of, uh, of any new technology in the lab, but particularly digital pathology and AI. So I would encourage anybody if you're aware of a project that's going on in your department or in your region or nationally, um, try and get involved, get engaged, attend those meetings, um, start to build up your background knowledge on exactly what's going on, because it's every bit as important to have people that are sceptic about technology and people that are maybe agnostic and not too sure what they think to get them in the room as well, and to make sure we're getting balanced opinion and input from everybody. So that's the first thing. Second thing, perhaps I always like to give some very practical little things that we can all do. Um, so obviously, I think um, digital pathology and AI should, if it's not already fairly high on your priority of continuing professional development targets, it should be starting to make its way up there in your consciousness. Um, so the first thing that you can do very easily is just to start thinking about uh, well, looking in a bit more depth at um, developments in your particular area of pathology regarding AI. Look out some of those um, brilliant papers that some of this morning's speakers highlighted in their talks. Start to get a real feel for what is actually available now uh, in the world of AI, what is being developed in the universities and in industry now. And you don't need to have detailed knowledge of coding or IT or informatics to do this. You just need to bring your professional knowledge and your, your critical gaze to it. Start to look at, you know, what problem is this application addressing? Is it actually a real problem that exists in pathology? As has this developer maybe slightly missed the point here? Um, do I think this is, you know, an appropriate use of technology? Do I think that these results are, are meaningful? So start to engage in that way. Um, if you can, um, and you start accessing uh, things, if you're a histopathologist, try and start accessing uh, digital pathology images as much as possible. Now, I know that you might not have um, a deployment in your department, but there are brilliant resources um, online. There's the pathology portal. Um, there's the uh, virtual pathology website of the University of Leeds. Get online, start looking at digital images, start to get comfortable looking at those images, because it's only if you're comfortable and able to interpret those images yourself that you'll be able to transfer that knowledge over to um, 
looking at you know an AI interpretation of the same digital image. So those would be sort of my, my two main things. As a whole sort of cohort and a profession, what we really need in order for um, effective clinical AI to be rolled out at scale is to have a cohort of experienced pathologists who are um, comfortable and confident using digital pathology and making digital diagnosis um, so that we have people who can um, meaningfully evaluate and assess um, new developments, new AI products as they come out. And if you do have some experience with digital pathology, or even if you don't, I really would recommend, um, you know, if, if you're getting uh, knocks on your door because you're a department that's gone digital, you're getting knocks on the door from developers, from ac academia, from industry, asking you to have input or to trial out products. This is a really, really great opportunity um, to have some professional influence on the shape of AI um, in time to come, whether that's you know with um, ready to market products or engaging in some form of co-development, either with uh, your local academic institution or industry. So that's a few things to start with. I'm not going to go on. I know there's plenty more people with very valuable things to say on this topic. OK, thank you. Um, so moving round, um, Dr. Ajlan, do you um, have any thoughts about AI? In the content, what Bethany said? Yeah, uh, actually, AI is going to be the future, whether we like it or we don't like it as a pathologist. And, uh, you know, uh, people has to move actually to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is going to be a bath assistant. It will be aiding, helping to reduce the time for the pathologist to do the reporting. It can help also in screening. It can help even in predicting the outcome and the molecular, you know, uh, if you do, cannot do the molecular uh, in the near future, uh, it will be the artificial intelligence who can guide to targeted therapy at a cheaper cost, you know, especially for poor countries. Uh, there is no limit actually to the artificial intelligence. There are difficulties, but uh, I think uh, if you are not, if we are not engaged into the artificial intelligence right now, it will be too late, you know, in five, six years down the road. So uh, we encourage people, not only, you know, individual people, but also organizations and hospitals and, uh, you know, even creating repositories and different organs and, uh, you know, bringing the world together where, you know, uh, we can share the, the different, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, trends of artificial intelligence and even sharing the experience in different parts of the world, what works in, in one geographic area, not necessarily to be working exactly uh, in another area. So uh, I think it's a wake up call for everybody, all the pathologists, if we were away, everybody's in his own room and uh, not seeing the, the other pathologists. I think it's a time actually to communicate with each other, share the, the cases, share the algorithms, uh, share also the, the vision of the future. And without collaboration, without, you know, uh, institutions working together and pathologists working together and uh, IT people will not be able to actually predict or be part of the future of pathology. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Bet Mooney. On, on, oops. Yes, I, I agree with, with what Bethany's just sort of described. Get get involved, um, learn more about it. If um, and 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 the and the and the require the need for having space for people who are agnostic and skeptic and so on, so that we can have those discussions. My 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 approach really uh, over the years since I've got to know more about digital pathology is that although its benefits and therefore the benefits of AI um, have been discussed very widely. I'm still surprised that the scale of adoption is, is relatively limited in terms of its use as a primary diagnostic tool. So my, my area of interest, and I think this will apply to the, to the integration of AI um, into the workflow. So my, my area of interest is really more about human factors and more holistic diagnostic pathway factors that will help us understand how wh where the potential obstacles are and where we need to exert some um, effort and industry 
to 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 remove those obstacles. Um, I spent quite a bit of time um, in my career working in digital health as, uh, uh, you know, a wider area um, than just digital pathology. And certainly there are there are people who are working in digital health who understand very clearly how we can deploy, integrate much more holistically. And they've developed frameworks that allow you to do that. Um, so in terms of AI, I think you know, its benefits, I think, don't need to be rehearsed, uh, but deployment into clinical practice is going to be difficult. Um, radiology has had AI for some time and still use in, in diagnostic practice is, is limited. So I would, I would um, recommend that we think slightly more widely about the human factors we need to be thinking about and, um, and, and particularly more holistically. And I think Professor Louis this morning in, in her talk on the, on the diagnostic, the Lancet Commission for Diagnostics really highlighted some of these obstacles um, in, in the context of international pathology in low medium income countries. But some of those challenges I think for innovation and adopting innovation um, exists very much in, 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 in high income countries too, um, to, a, to a slightly different degree. So um, that, that's where I would counsel, I think, um, thinking about, about frameworks and thinking holistically um, about some of the potential challenges we'll, 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 ex we'll have to experience when we're thinking about deploying AI you know, in anger, if you like, um, in, 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 in practice. Thank you very much. Professor Naresh, any thoughts on AI and its use? Well, probably, I think, uh, I will speak about AI a little later, but I just wanted to uh, bring to this discussion the how di digital pathology is playing a role in our uh, current lives. Um, we recently had a meeting about a week back of the Society of Hematopathology. And the way the cases were discussed was on a, on a single uh, web page, on a single platform, we had the completely digitized slides with all the immunohistoric chemistry and the DNA and RNA being analyzed on the same pipeline. And on the same web page, you have mutation studies, you've got copy number changes, you've got translocations and expression data. And along with the slide, I mean, I'm. I'm I would have liked to show that directly, but because I think the, the society has said it can't be shown, so I'm unable to share that. But that's the reality. We are going to be dealing soon with a way where on our screens, we will be able to look at everything in an integrated manner. So I think these are the things which really will enthuse students and the younger lot to really imbibe this and embrace the whole thing. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Carey. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm an optimist that when we as morphologists, we're not all going to be put out of a job by, by AI, but I think it is going to make us much more efficient. We've got already commercially available um, uh, uh, software which uh, supplements scanners for looking at peripheral blood films. And instead of, instead of sitting in a microscope and, and hunting around cells of interest, you're presented with a with a screen which has got here are you know a dozen neutrophils here are a dozen lymphocytes here are a dozen monocytes here are a dozen cells I'm not sure what they are the machine says according to its algorithm and you can be much more efficient at interpretation and I uh, coming back to Malawi I, at the moment um, uh, I am presented every few days with maybe six or ten cases uh, where the, the pediatricians have been trained to, to take bone marrow or peripheral blood or fine needle aspirates, uh, stain them at the end of the side room at the end of the pediatric ward and, and take fo photo micrographs of um, uh, potential cells of interest. And I, I can look at a dozen photographs from a case very quickly because um, there are only, you know, 12 images. Um, when the time comes where we get the bandwidth that they can put a slide in a scanner and the whole slide comes, my work, I fear for that time in a sense, although it, 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 it'll be much possible to offer a much greater quality, um, but, but, but it's an enormous workload. Um, and 
up with artificial intelligence, at least helping maybe field selection or here are some cells of interest, it, it may make it feasible rather than daunting. Um, so, so that's just a thought. Okay, thank you. Plenty to think about then on the thoughts about AI. So moving on to our second question, which was uh, for Dr. Alal Jalan. Um, so how could digital pathology help tackle inequalities in healthcare provision globally? So if you share your thoughts on that and then we'll ask everybody else what they think. Okay, uh, in, in my experience with even, you know, uh, sharing the information with, uh, with people in digital pathology, I think uh, people are very able from the IT, they are very able from, they can do a, a lot of things and innovations. But really, the health economics, which is very important for the digital pathology, it is not very much addressed very well. I'll just give you some figures. Uh, almost 70% of the scanners in the world is either underused or underutilized. Uh, did anybody think, you know, you know, how much resources we are wasting while other countries or other places, they may not be able even uh, to... to have the resources to, to have the, the, the scanners. Do you know that the digital pathology solution in total in the USA is at least 40% higher than in Europe? And uh, maybe in Russia and Eastern Europe, the cost of the digitalization is even lower than Europe. Uh, and I mean, when we speak about uh, uh, healthcare provision, we refer to inputs such as budget, manpower, equipment, and supply. And uh, those countries, there are countries which are poor, there are countries who are struggling in their economy, and they cannot afford, you know, when you ask them, go for digital pathology now, to go to the American model, to the, the, uh, the uh, European model, how many solutions are there, and why many scanners are laying down in, in, in different departments for different reasons. 80% of the scanners in the US are, they are not used for clinical. They are used for artificial intelligence and other things. I'm just, you know, raising some questions. Why they are not functioning? Why there is no scanning companies? Actually, there is, a, you know, scanning service that rather than you do few uh, scanning of slides, you can do, you know, a huge number of scanning. That will be why the it is it doesn't move to a subscription-based economy which may, it will be a transaction bear uh, case. If you look around in the world, nobody's really thinking about that. I, I speak to experts and they, are, they know everything, but when it comes to the economy, still they cannot compare and contrast. And when we come to, uh, you know, breaking the boundaries, you know, uh, with the countries with uh, struggling in their economy and they don't have enough pathologists, they don't have, you know, uh, competent uh, the technologists, they don't have residency training, uh, we have to look at it from the economy. So we can use it for second opinion, but why not for primary opinion? And why not, you know, you know, how did we go really to the cost of the individual case? How we do that? I, don't, I think, no, you know, I wouldn't say nobody addressed it, but I say very few people really speak about the economy of the digital pathology and the added value. Uh, as I mentioned to the, today in the, in the presentation, I'm, I'm uh, very impressed with some educational, you know, hubs that is, are available, and those uh, should help, you know, to break the barrier, uh, you know, in one way that you know, train people, you educate them, uh, even history technologists when they send a slide of poor quality to 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 another country. I'm sure, you know, the feedback itself, it will be helpful. They should they raise their bar of the quality in the, the slide because you cannot read the digital pathology uh, without this. Uh, you know, we're speaking, and I'm just raising you know, an issue. Uh, humanitarian aids are given by different countries in the world. Is there any, any initiative that came from anybody in the world that, you know, how we can help in digitalizing, you know, helping in, in, in using those aids. It comes from Saudi Arabia, it comes from US, from Europe, different parts of from UK, from Germany. Uh, are we, you know, even targeting humanitarian aids to, to really help the people, cancer patient, patient who need, you know, uh, access to care? Did, did, did we address this? Uh, is there any initiative or platforms that really people can log in? Now, everybody who does a second opinion 
they know somebody and they send it to him. And this is not the way it should be done. There should be a big platform. There should be a, a, a whole different process of the scanner. The cost of the scanner, when it comes to the cost of, the, uh, uh, of making the scanner, it is at least 10 times you know, the, the price. And you know the, the, the reason? The reason is because they produce less and therefore the cost goes high. People when they speak about digital pathology, they forget about you know, the, the economies. Uh, the price, I can assure you, in the coming three, four years, it will be at least 50% less. And the boundaries and the difference between the different scanners, it's getting you know, smaller and smaller all the time. The FDA approved the scanners, they are not good for cytology. And people think they, they are they, the, 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 the best. Many other scanners which are not FDA approved, uh, they are actually uh, of a better quality, particularly in cytology. Uh, so uh, coming back, we have issues, first of all, uh, we have to not only to overcome the difficulties of the shortage of pathologists, but it's important to, you know, uh, localize even residency training using the digital pathology and people can be trained from distance and uh, they, they can have, you know, time that they can spend in the UK or USA or in other places. Uh, of course, educational material and uh, sharing the uh, information repositories for different uh, diagnoses and people can access it that will elevate that will be a help from the richer side of the uh, of the world to the poorer side of the, the world uh, but also have to be honest if i'm in uh, if i'm in in one of the african countries don't expect me to bring you know the best uh, fda approved uh, software and uh, you know uh, uh, scanner uh, scanning time is now still not very fast. In the future, it will be much faster. The cost of the storage is going to go, go less. So I can speak for two hours, actually, about the health economy and the digital pathology. And then we'll speak about artificial intelligence also, because that will do scans and screening. That will identify where do you need to, to put your time and your energy and uh, where you can reduce the cost, where you can sometime have alternative for molecular studies that you can do with certain cancer patient, and you can predict it. It may not be as good as molecular, but it will give at least the people better chance of, uh, you know, identifying what is the targeted therapy and uh, what is the, the behavior in the future. More collaboration, more, you know, scanning companies, more uh, big repositories, uh, I think, uh, and uh, the visions of a bla big platforms and uh, communicating even with the governments regarding humanitarian, humanitarian aids uh, to, to make sure that, you know, we can invest, we can help the people actually to invest in the right direction. Ultimately, these are can many of them are cancer patients that they are needy for the correct diagnosis. Okay. Thank you very much. Lots of thoughts there around economics, spare capacity, developments to come, all of which will play a role in uh, getting rid of the inequalities in healthcare, we hope. So, Dr. Bert Mooney, any thoughts on that? You're a bit quiet. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. I'd switched the button off. Um, the statistics that Dr. Alajlan just um, listed about the uh, underuse of scanners around the world, you know, 80% not, not being used for clinical, but for research actually sort of goes back to some of the first points we were discussing before, which is about the scale of adoption worldwide, because I, I, I think that that's an area we need, we need to deal with in terms of health inequalities um, that, you know, I think I don't need to repeat what Dr. Ajlan has just said about how we can promote better collaboration in, internationally. The other thing I would add though, in terms of health inequality and AI is, is being very clear and careful about how we develop algorithms and how we consider the diversity of, how, of, of the data that, that's used to develop algorithms and also the diversity of the workforce that's producing 
the algorithms. There's in the press, in the UK press this morning, there was a really interesting article that was reporting on a Lancet paper, which was on um, digital uh, imaging in dermatology. And what, what, they, what they identified there, that the databases that they're using for skin um, to, to develop algorithms was mostly on white skin. So then the whole algorithm development becomes skewed and we, we then build in AI rather than democratizing what it does is, 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 is um, sort of uh, exacerbate potential health inequality. So I think when we're talking about AI, we need to make sure that the workforce developing it is diverse and that the data is diverse. And in the skin example from the press this morning, this was mainly because ethnicity wasn't being recorded in the data. So we, we could, we, as we're screening and collating data, we, we should be thinking about diversity, I think, in order to, to, to make sure we don't compound inequalities. Thank you. Very, very interesting point there. Uh, Professor Naresh, what thoughts? Um, yeah, I think overall, just focusing on how digital pathology is breaking the ba international barriers, I think I'm very positive. That comes from my experience, like a, on a weekly basis, uh, I'm involved in running an MDT uh, in Uganda, where the slides are scanned in Uganda, they're uploaded on uh, about 12 hours before the meeting, and I'm, I'm able to see them and participate in the, in the lymphoma MDT at Uganda. So I'm quite positive about it. But what we also need to uh, understand, it's not just the digital pathology that has made this possible, uh, it's also the telecommunications, which um, and the the Microsoft Teams, the Zoom, all these platforms, which has actually uh, the usage has improved a lot during the COVID era. Like I'm still in uh, connection with my friends and colleagues in the UK, in London, and in Imperial. And when there is a difficult case, I'm very happy to uh, support them and look at the cases uh, live with them. And again, in all these pursuits, you there is no um, breakage of, about patient confidentiality. You're not talking about the patients, uh, any of the confidential information. We are just looking at slides and having an academic discussion. So this has been possible both by digital pathology and the current platforms available. The only thing that one people have to recognize is this will all remain as an academic discussion and not as a, a clinical decision making because you are not actually signing out a report. So some of the barriers that we need to address is how do we get across licensing? How do we make sure that a person's opinion can be treated as an official opinion, which I think osteopaths has and other structures similar to osteopaths will have a major role to play, um, which I think probably in the years to come, I think will be a major focus apart from the the AI devices, which is another issue, but licensing is, is, is going to be quite an important thing. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Carey. Uh, yes, I think um, it's in terms of globalization. I mean, clearly the scanners can solve the problem of the material being uh, geographically in a, in a different place from the expertise. Um, the, uh, Dr. Alajan did uh, point out the issue of quality. If you divorce the, the person taking and processing the material from the person who's interpreting it, there is a danger that the quality slips. And I regard one of my, my important roles in, in Malawi is not just to offer an opinion on what I think the diagnosis might be, but also to encourage or make constructive comments about the staining, about the spreading of the smears and all that kind of thing, because I think that can slip. And I think um, um, the other issue, of course, is it, it, what it doesn't help with is triangulation with the immunophenotype or the cytogenetic or the molecular findings. We've got a big problem there because, uh, you know, do you try and do the testing locally? Do you try and get material out to do that with? I mean, uh, efforts with, our, with Malawi, it's all retrospective. We can get, we can get unstained slides out retrospectively and do immunocytochemistry on them, do fish on them. Um, how are we going to get around the triangulation uh, uh, of, um, 
um, the other modalities that we use in, in Western medicine to make robust diagnoses. I think that's the problem. Okay, thank you very much. And last but not least, Bethany. Well, I think perhaps here it might be useful to just sort of talk a little bit about sort of some of the um, work that we're currently doing in the UK as part of the National Pathology Imaging Cooperative. So one of the key um, drivers we had was trying to tackle some of the healthcare inequalities that we could actually see uh, within our own region. So with that in mind, we uh, are currently deploying a 19 center digital pathology uh, network encompassing sites across Yorkshire and the north of England that serve the needs of over uh, 6 million uh, patients with pathology services. And these include some of the most sparsely populated uh, parts of the UK that have uh, some of the poorest healthcare outcomes and the poorest access to secondary and expert uh, pathological opinion. So we're really hoping that um, implementing this network is going to really help us in cutting um, some of those significant and unacceptable delays, which uh, some patients uh, through because of you know, geographical uh, reasons uh, that, 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 that some patients are exposed to. So it's you know, a first step on a regional level, but I think it's that inherent flexibility and transferability of, um, of digital pathology slides and those opportunities to work flexibly and remotely that could help us to tailor solutions for other problems on a larger scale and on a, a, a national and an international scale um, in the future. Thank you very much. So flexibility uh, is, is the bone of this and hopefully developing on a regional scale and then moving out internationally. Thank you very much. OK, moving forward to our next question. Um, and going to be started off uh, by Dr. Bet Mooney. Uh, what is meant by sustainable digital practice and how do we achieve this globally? Well, sustainable here. Um, I was thinking about this um, in the run up to, to today's meeting. Um, I'm, I won't be talking about sustainability in the, in the um, COP26 context um although you know there are there are areas for example on 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 how green our servers and how how do we run huge servers but i'll put that aside because that is that is an area for actually consideration at some point so i'm putting it aside not because it's in, unimportant but because um what i'm talking about sustainable here is sustainable in the sense that a digital pathology project continues beyond just the initial, um, I'm going to look and see if this works for us in a department or in a, in a unit and so on. Um, and, and the reason I, I find this really interesting is because the experience, as I was alluding to earlier, in digital health more broadly, is that technology, although it might get implemented, it, it, it gets abandoned quite quickly too. So we've got to be wary about this, particularly considering the huge costs involved in, in digital pathology rollout. So, and, 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 and with an international context, um, certainly the WHO in, in, in concert with people like Johns Hopkins in, in the States have developed some um, toolkits that allow people to understand how to deploy digital health innovations. Um, in, in, in the UK, in, in Oxford, um, we've got academics who've developed toolkits, again, that allow us to avoid abandonment. So um, Trish Greenhalgh in, in, in Oxford has, has worked on something called the NAS framework, which is non-adoption, abandonment, spread, um, scale up, sustainability nas and and what that's about is to avoid is to avoid the abandonment of technology once um, once once it appears to have been adopted and um, you know i've certainly known in 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 in, in labs technology, not digital pathology, technology being deployed and then it gets abandoned because for various reasons so what i for sustainability I think we need to be thinking about things holistically and we need to try and deploy some of the frameworks that colleagues in digital health have been using and their frameworks are really 
they're, they're not complex, but they're, uh, but they, but I don't think we do them enough in pathology. So it's about looking at, you know, for example, what the technology is, what its value addedness is, um, who are the adopters, the staff, what are their needs, who are the, what are, what's the impact on patients, you know, the organization in which it's going to be adopted, you know, what, what's that like, how, how technology uh, ready is it, the wider system, the politics, the policy makers, uh, you know, sociocultural areas. Now, it sounds very complicated, but I think if we don't look holistically, and I think Professor Louis this morning in her excellent um, talk actually um, highlighted some of these things. So the, you know, the international solidarity she was talking about, how we achieve change, it's really, I think, can be done um, through, through deploying some of these frameworks. And internationally, you know, um, that means we need to understand the health system we're looking at deploying something in. You know, if we've started an evaluation project or a second opinion project, how would it be sustained once that project is finished and so on and so forth? I think it's a really interesting area which is centered around human factors, really, uh, and how we best understand how we use the technology um, for, for our patients. Thank you. Professor Naresh. Hello. I think it was beautifully summarized by Dr. Beth Mori. Uh, sustainability is a very complex issue. And I think it is that the drivers uh, can be multiple. And if you just, but the good news is this technology has been around in some form for more than 10 years and it is still going on. And there is, um, we are still unable to cope with the requirement of the technology. So at least for some years to come, the technology will remain and we will be catching up and making it sustainable. But the, the question about whether a technology can become redundant, I mean, I think it's good to start thinking about it because at some point, at least parts of the technology may become redundant. If you just look at how the genomics have evolved, uh, 15 years back, if you walked into any lab, you would have had you would see a large number of PCR machines, which you hardly ever see now. Now everything has become next generation sequencing and it's multiplexing. So the conventional PCR machine, you will see the old machine sitting in some corner being unused. So I wouldn't be surprised 20 years down the line, the scanners that we are talking about today will be sitting somewhere in a, a, with full of dust in a corner. That's, that is possible, that, but that does not mean that we need to think about solutions for today. So I think it has been beautifully summarized. We got to be sensitive to all the issues, but we have to invest in something that is relevant today. Thank you. Dr. Carey. Uh, yes, I, I just uh, thinking back to um, the, the, the redundancy of machine use we, we heard about, and also back to the, I, I don't know whether everybody got the chance to hear uh, um, Ding being interviewed um, at lunchtime today and his charitable work with his ex um, um, uh, initiative um, is an inspiration in making sure that kit gets continues to be used when I mean, we've heard about the fact that these scanners are going to get quicker but it doesn't mean that um, I mean time is not necessarily a big problem for some of our um, some of the people we're able to help out with and I think it's very important for sustainability that that kit that does get out there is recycled and, and used um, uh, as best as, as we can and not, not left in the corner. Excellent, thank you. Bethany? Um, excellent points made so far. So it's the only different thing I would bring to the equation is if we're thinking about sustainability, maybe what we really need to do is make sure that we are letting our patients and our public know what we are doing and what developments um, are in train because if our patients see value in what we do and believe me from all the work I've done in PPI they really do um, our patients um, you know at least regularly come and visit our digital pathology department we've been digital since 2018 uh, we show them our pathologists at work we show them pathology on big um, computer display screens um, and they are shocked that this isn't standard practice across the NHS and they are shocked that there is any trouble getting funding for projects to connect up hospitals um, 
there is you know an expectation that we are utilizing the best technology that's available um you know and things that would things that would at least match the sort of technology that the average person now has in their home for domestic use um so i think you know if we can um really share what we're doing with the public and be open and transparent and then let the public hold us accountable for how um well we are using and using those that, that technology um, and what use we're making of uh, you know any public or private investment that's gone into um, these systems. I think that will be a, a big step towards um, creating a sustainable uh, digital pathology and AI service. Okay, thanks very much. And last but not least, Dr. Ajlan. Yes, uh, I can add the very few things, uh, you know, in addition to what my colleagues mentioned already. Uh, what I, I can say is that the we need to invest on the new generation more and more you know in uh, you know adopting the digital pathology A residency training sh should become you know uh, the digital format is should be the main platform uh, we have to get rid of the fear of the digital pathology we have to show also the community the value add the added value you know to to to, to what we are doing uh, I cannot add uh, more than uh, what uh, my colleagues mentioned already. Okay, thank you very, very much. Okay, moving forward, um, two more areas to talk about before we finish the main round table and move to the Q&A. Um, so, Professor Naresh, what are the challenges we face with regards to regulation of pathology-based AI products? And we've touched on this before, so excellent. So I was just trying to think, what are the players? What are the main factors to consider? Um, we already have spoken about morphology and biomarker design and application. This is whatever may be the AI solution that we will have machine learning, but we can't get away with having high quality morphology and very good biomarker design and application. That is a must. Then we know the utility of high quality digital pathology and the importance of pathologists using the high quality digital pathology in making a clinical uh, decision. But what we are now discussing is how can we use machines to learn this digitized pathology data and either directly lead to clinical decision making or help the pathologist to come to this decision more easily. And that's the kind of question that we need to address. Few years back, there was a machine learning experiment that was done in University of Washington. Here you have one of them uh, is, is a husky and the other one is a wolf. They look very similar. So people, one of the students collected a large number of photographs and tried to I, I come up with an algorithm to classify husky and a wolf. And the algorithm came up with a 95 or 98% accuracy. And he went to the supervisor and said, I have built an algorithm, which is fantastic, 98% accuracy. And then when they, so that's the problem with AI, was it, it was too good to be true. Then when they started looking at how beautifully it was able to classify from the ears or the nose or the tongue or whatever, what actually stood out was the, the photograph that they had put in the system, most of the um, wolves were on snow. And most of the huskies were from uh, from uh, were pets were in uh, were in the background of something other than snow. So what they had built with 98% accuracy was actually a snow classifier and not an animal classifier. So that's what we got to be careful about in any of these AI solutions. I just want to bring to notice we are talking today about AI. But even without being noticed or even without having much of the propaganda, it's nearly more than 10 years that we, uh, we introduced this at Imperial something about eight or nine years back. In cytogenetics, we have been using classifiers to classify signals automatically in a robotized stage. More than 10 years, we have experience with this. So a cell can be classified into whether it's giving two green signals, two red signals, or whatever way, and it will put them in an order and present to you. These are the number of cells which have got these types of signals. So this has been in existence even before we started thinking about 
all these issues about regulation of um, artificial intelligence and pathology. But when you look at how many, I mean, we just heard about from Peter Carey about the classifier that we use currently in blood film, which can classify different types of white cells. It can classify the, it can even present to the blast. It can present to the unclassified cells. And this came into, the FDA approved this only in October, 2020. But even today, we don't have a classifier to be used on a bone marrow aspirate. Similarly, I think one of the big things that happened in the last month is a, an FDA approved solution for prostate cancer. I used to pity my colleagues who used to look at these template biopsies of needle course of prostate. And I think their lives would be far easier than as when an instrument like this can actually point an area which is abnormal in multiple prostate needle co-biopsies. So if you just look at this, what, why is this difficult? Why are there only two morphology-based FDA-approved devices? It's because the, the regulatory bodies look at this as a medical device. And if you look at the current regulation, it, the, the photograph is one what you see in a theater. It's on the, the, the way you look at a medical a pathology AI device is exactly the same. You would look at a radiology device, an interventional radiology device, or a, at a device you use in an operation system. So there's a huge amount of work is going on in the last uh, two or three years at FDA, at the MH, MHRA and similar bodies, which is developing all the principles that is required to to regulate, to evaluate these kind of um, devices before it is, it is made available for uses uh, for clinical decision making. Um, just to go through some of these principles, and you can see the question that usually asks what aspects of a particular practice is being taken over by a machine, and how is this change going to be brought about? The biggest question and the stumbling block is to clearly understand and represent there are mul the, the multitudes of parameters that go into making a clinical decision. How the machine is actually making, even the experts do not understand today. And conveying that, how a decision is made to a regulatory body or to the public is, is quite difficult. And that's where I think much of the uh, work is currently ongoing. How an algorithm can learn and change while remaining safe and effective and how can this be a continued process? And if you look at now, there is some, like the good medical practice, you have a good machine learning practice. This was collectively developed by the FDA, the MHRA and the Health Canada. And there are 10 main principles based on which you got to design a good machine learning practice. Um, and again, all these things have to be patient-centered. It has to be transparent. Because patients should know how you're making a decision. Because if you're, allowing a, 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 a machine to screen out and say all the normal prostate cores from something which has got a small 1% area with cancer, you need to have public confidence in such a, such a device. And other important thing that uh, the, um, the, the FDA and the organization similar to that is uh, uh, pushing back on, these, uh, on the companies that they need to collect real world data and this has to be an ongoing process and so that they can keep on mitigating the risks that are there and improve the be benefit to risk uh, profile. Uh, so uh, this is what I wanted to cover. Uh, let me stop sharing. So there's okay. a huge amount of regulation. As I showed there, most of the FDA approved AI diagnostic uh, stuff is all in radiology. There are very few in pathology, but I'm sure there's a lot in the pipeline. There are challenges. Uh, and I think this is going to be an on, um, ongoing, very steep learning curve. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of time. So if we could be succinct in our responses, that would be fantastic. Um, moving forward, Dr. Carey. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, very interesting points about regulation. I, I, I worry about... Um, you know, my own ser service to Malawi, but there's not really any external quality assessment. Um, um, I like to think I'm kind of mindful of that fact. And, and uh, but, it, but 
as we start to use these things, particularly globally, and we're sharing across, I mean, it's hard enough, it's hard enough sharing or passporting um, um, certification and qualification of opinion between different NHS trusts in the in the, in the same country in England, um, but sharing across uh, globally is, is 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 hard. So there will be challenges for us, I'm sure. Thank you, uh, Bethany. I just very quickly say I think the most sort of challenging area for me that I can see in all this is this um, idea of, a, of the black box AI and what we do in circumstances where there isn't a level of, sort of human interpretability of the results. So as pathologists, we know we can quite happily uh, you know, do our day job. And you know, if we're challenged on a particular result or a particular diagnosis that a patient isn't expecting or isn't happy with that we can explain the process we've taken to reach that result and obviously um, there's the potential that with some of these black box applications we're losing that connection we're losing that explainability of you know, a result which might have very far-reaching um, implications for a patient. So I think this is one of the areas that's not just going to be important in getting public trust in use of AI and pathology, but also getting the trust and a consensus amongst our colleagues as pathologists that we are actually happy to sit down and use these type of applications. And maybe we need to think very carefully about the scope of, um, of the use of such devices if we if we do end up with the, uh, the black box um, computer says yes or no um, type products at some point down the line. OK, thank you. Dr. Al al -Jalan. Yeah, I can say the most uh, important thing is the, the regulation, the, the, the regulatory rules and the medical legal, legal aspects, because uh, this is not really covered uh, very well in any part of the world. This is a challenge. I'm sure we will come to a conclusion at the end. But uh, I mean, medical legally and, uh, you know, certification uh, is a big issue. Thank you very much. And Dr. Betmoni. Um, uh, yes, to the to, to the previous speakers' points, and also um, I think um, for it to be used, um, even if it's regulated for pathologist whose name is on the report, I think we're going to need to understand how it works and how we may be able to troubleshoot it. So I think there's a huge training element um, involved, um, and then the other for me, um, I think we need to be very clear that the tool that we're using isn't going to compound any health inequalities. So I go back to my diversity um, point earlier on. Okay, thank you very much. Some fascinating insights into there. Um, okay, I'm conscious we've only got 10 minutes left and, and I'm also conscious that there are some question and answers in the box. What I would suggest is perhaps uh, perhaps the panel could write the answer, their answers to the Q&A because I think this discussion has been very valuable to everyone listening to it. That's why I've uh, kept it going. So finally, and by far not, not least, Dr. Carey going to talk to us about telepathology, and then we'll have some final input from everybody. Yes. OK, so the, the, um, I, I was asked to address the kind of the future of uh, telepathology. And I think we've, we've had glimpses into the future, particularly from um, um, from uh, Dr. Tabaki and from Professor Rajput this morning. Um, and I, I think one way of looking into the future, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by um, Sir Muir Gray, who's a, a, a wonderful um, uh, public health physician in Oxford. He says, well, if you want to see into the future, just look around you now, it'll be there. And it's just a matter of picking out, you know, what is going to develop and which of the, the, the new things are going to fall by the wayside. Um, what we can do is to, is to look to our colleagues in radiology because we're, we're about a decade and a half behind them with digitization. Um, the reason for that is they were able to fund it all by getting rid of all of their you know, heavy silver packets of x-rays, saving huge amounts of money, transporting those in, in um, uh, reinforced um, silos and um, and having porters bringing things to MDTs, gantries of um, um, uh, light boxes, horrible chemicals in uh, radiology departments developing all this stuff. They got rid of all of that, saved a massive amount of money and funded nice um, uh, high resolution um, 
uh, screens and, and were able to digitize. Whereas in pathology, of course, we've still got to, we've got to make the slides on glass. We've still got to stain them with the horrible chemicals. We've got to cover slit them. Then, um, you know, we've got our microscopes. And if the, if the expertise is in the same place as the material, we manage. Um, so the uh, digitization is, is not instead of, it's as, it's as well as. Now, of course, we then we solve the problem of the geographical separation of the material and the uh, expertise, as we've uh, mentioned. Um, um, and we can also, yeah, the huge other advantages that we can apply AI to the images, we can distribute workload even within an organization, we can work across sites, and we can see the advantages of it. Um, I think it, in the UK, we've actually been helped by COVID, amazingly. We don't like the idea, people don't like the idea of, of, of a haematologist who is being forced to self-isolate, who's actually perfectly well, and has got to go home. Well, with a, with a scanner, he can be quite uh, productive, he or she can be quite productive. Um, and so we're solving that problem. And we've now got, we've, we've, we're implementing the, 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 um, the, um, the, the, the peripheral blood slide uh, scanners across the um, northern region now, um, really rather later than a lot of our other colleagues have. But I think um, the, the, in, in terms of telepathology, that is really the, 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 the way forward. And I, I, I'm going to stop because I, I'm, I'm aware of passage of time going by. OK, thanks very much. Um, Bethany. You're muted. Sorry, I was just uh, very quickly trying to type away in the box, uh, responding to some questions about uh, examples of patient and public involvement in digital pathology. So I wonder if I can just very quickly use this opportunity to just um, highlight how vitally important it is. Um, as we know, you know, we are sometimes painted as the backroom uh, doctors in the hospital. Not everyone in the public is quite sure what we do, but when they do find out what we do, people are generally absolutely fascinated with the work we do. And they're particularly interested in these technological um, developments. So we very regularly invite um, patient groups in particular, um, some of our um, cancer survivor groups and people that work in some of our um, uh, that are part of some of our um, patient advocacy and patient charity um, societies at the hospital. We get them to come in, see exactly what we do, come and learn a bit about pathology, um, see our digital images, Digital pathology is such an amazingly engaging and accessible way for us to communicate with the public about um, healthcare topics. And I think this might be a real area we want to expand on in the future when we're looking at um, how we communicate um, with the public on different media, but also in exploring whether there might be a role in certain circumstances for sharing some of these digital images as part of the patient pathway with patients. And I can think of you know, some scenarios where I think it might be very helpful to actually see with your own eyes uh, some of what's going on in your own body. Thank you very much. Dr. Al Al Jalal. I may just have one comment. There was a question about electron microscopy uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. And in truth, electron microscopy has changed a lot recently. With the cryo electron microscopy, we can go to the protein level, actually. We, we don't need to predict we can actually confirm, you know, what, what we have. Uh, we are in the process of actually, in, in at our institution, we're in the process of including the electron microscopy as part of the digital pathology, as well as hematopathology. It will be all three in one, and uh, it, it will open all for us also opportunity, you know, even for, uh, you know, renal uh, cases to predict, you know, from the electron microscopy finding, you know, to, to bring the artificial intelligence, not only from one side, but to take uh, the image of all the three, including immunofluorescence, including the electron microscopy and HNE to reach, uh, you know, through the artificial intelligence, you know, some thoughts or it may be aiding the, the pathologist initially, but ultimately who knows, it, it could be able also to make a diagnosis. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bet Mooney. Um, yeah, go, going back to sort of what, what the future might be and, and, and some of the things that Dr. Dr. Carey raised, I, I think 
some of the things that we, we need to be mindful of, um, and we, 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 we touched on it earlier in, in terms of redundancy of machines and so on. So there will be other innovations. So I think we need to have a mindset that's open to future innovations and how we might take them on. The, I think it's going to be increasingly important um, for us um, to maybe adopt or adapt rather what our role as pathologists are. There was a fantastic paper a few years back um, by Eric Topol where he puts forward the notion that radiology and pathology should be integrated, should be combined, and we, we, we become effectively information specialists. So we are the interpreters of data. So I think um, there's going to be multimodal analyses, multi-data sets uh, through omics and, and, and radiology and histology, molecular and so on. So I think the future is going to be about integrating data or being able to interpret multiple sources of data for, for our patients, as we all already do to a certain extent with molecular. I think that's, that's going to expand. Um, and the other thing is with, with the push in the UK about maintaining health rather than treating disease is how does, how does digital pathology fit into the early diagnosis of cancer? So before maybe we've even got a, a biopsy specimen. Um, and I think this is where we working with other specialties like radiology and so on to interpret data is where our roles may change slightly. Thank you very much. And rounding off the round table, uh, Professor Naresh. Oh, yeah, I think uh, my colleagues have covered most of the things very beautifully. I think uh, the last aspect which we covered was integrating different aspects of pathology, not just morphology, but the chemical pathology, different aspects of genomic pathology, all coming into uh, onto a single platform and presenting it in a way that a clinician can understand what we say. What we say, I think that's going to be a challenge, and I think that has been a challenge for the last few years. And I think that area is going to expand, and I think we need to um, get ourselves ready for that that challenge. Thank you very much.